I've been in this industry for 50 years, and the cattle industry's been getting really attacked. I've spent 50 years of my career working with livestock. Have I been working with something that's totally terrible? So I decided to really start getting deep into the use of pasture and how that can be used to improve land. I have actually traveled to just about every rural area of the United States sometime during my career. Been to rural areas in Uruguay, Denmark, many, many different places, even China. You travel through eastern Colorado. If you take the toll road exit out from the airport and you drive 150 miles east, there's about a 100-mile stretch of land where the only thing you can do with that land is graze it. There's not enough groundwater for crops, and there's not enough sky water for crops. It is that simple. What do we do with 20% of the world's habitable land that can only be grazed? I think we have to be raising food on it. So let's look at the methane situation. A leaky oil field equipment puts out about the same amount of methane. Swamps put out a lot of methane. And then herds of bison that were here before Europeans came to the North America were about 80% the methane that's coming out now. Now your biggest polluter on carbon is power plants, period. Power plants. Big number one. Yep, we've got a coal-fired power plant. It eats a lot of coal. I've been over on the, over on the property watched it uh, dump a railroad cars full of coal into it. Um, and the other big eater and putter outer of carbon is transportation. Okay, now, I under now this is something where I don't think people have thought it through. California wants to go electric cars. They don't have enough power for that. So somebody put up a really silly picture of a car plugged into a charging station run by a diesel generator. Uh, that would not be very, very sustainable. Now, in my new book on visual thinking, you see, nothing is abstract for me. When I talk about the coal-fired power plant, in fact, I went by our power plant just the other day, and I know what a coal car looks like, and I know what a rail unload siding looks like. That thing eats a pile of rail cars. Okay, now, right now, let's just address the land that cannot be cropped. Though my mind is always working, oil field equipment. I got a picture on my phone of an oil pump, and I wanted to go up and commune with this oil pump because I learned it did something very interesting that I didn't know you could do with oil field equipment. It was pumping water. So now I start to imagine a pipeline built by an oil company that transports water because I just learned that oil field equipment could do something that I didn't know it could do. And we have the know-how. This gets into another thing I've been working on. I'm very concerned about our visual thinkers getting um, screened out of the educational system because we can't do algebra. I just went to two beautiful dairies up in Quebec. Uh, really, really good. Now, you, one of them's using robots, and the farmer modified the robot to make it work better, and then the company copied it. Yep, little guys innovate, big guys copy. I take a much more bottom-up approach to things. Because it, when I did my work on cattle handling, it started out one tiny project at a time. And then I wrote about it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of great information on grazing and on uh, uh, regenerative agriculture. But it's not even accessible online. Like, I get the Stockman grass farmer. None of that stuff can be Googled. I can't even get the title in a paywall. No, we've got to get knowledge out there. I've done a lot of things to improve the cattle industry, but one of the things I did, starting really early on, is I simply wrote about how to design things and how to handle cattle. Put the information out there. Too many people hold on to their intellectual property too much. You know, I'm glad that facilities I've designed have been designed by Grandin.com, that's my web page, all around the world because I'm interested in getting information out there. And we have to figure out how to actually do stuff. There's two ways to approach problem solving. Top down, like the first panel, there's a place for that. Very vague, but no um, uh, guidance on how to implement. And more bottom up, like get, getting into something specific like berry packages. 
which are a big user of plastic. That's something much more specific. In fact, a lady who developed a cardboard berry package, I've actually been consulting with her a little bit in discussing the problems of getting a big guy to start using it. So let's get back to the grazing. So I decided to write a paper on grazing. And I started just going through all the scientific literature that I could find on grazing when it's used to improve land, also on using grazing animals with cover crops. You have two big things. We can do grazing just on regular grazing land, and we can do grazing cover crops. So if you're a farmer doing corn or soy, every third year you might print some wheat. You might uh, not print it, plant some wheat. You might plant some wheat, and if you graze it before it heads out, it's grass. We use grass until it heads out. It's that simple. Can't, they can't eat it when it heads out because that would not be grass-fed beef. And there's some real advantages to that. It improves the soil health. The other thing that's happening is artificial fertilizer prices are going up. How many people here know that artificial fertilizer is made from methane? That's what it's made out of. It's made out of natural gas. First thing they shut down in the UK was the artificial fertilizer plant. And then the prices skyrocketed. Well, it's got this other kind of fertilizer that comes out the back end of livestock. <laughs> and that can be used as a part of a grazing with co uh, grazing cover crops. You know, but unfortunately, we've got ag policy that promotes monoculture. You know, we've got to get away from monoculture. And looking at things in the future, I think what we need to be doing in the future, because I'm a very practical person, mostly organic, but not pure. Don't be too pure. Mostly organic. Because the thing that's interesting about big corporations, little guys innovate, big guys copy. I'll tell you that. Little guys innovate, big guys copy. And I've worked with a lot of big guys. Let's take feeding probiotics to chickens as a way to reduce antibiotics. 15 years ago, the chicken industry stuck their nose up at that, like this is stupid. And then right before COVID, one of the big international trade show that used to be called the poultry show, and you got giant banners hanging down over the escalators uh, advertising probiotics. They copied it. Something that they originally thought was stupid, they ended up copying. And so one thing I like to do is let's, you know, tell them how to do it. I actually stay out of politics. My approach is totally bottom up. And you might find my talks rambling so much because I don't have slides. I also am an associative thinker. I'm an associative thinker. I don't think top down where there's a basic principle. But there's so many basic principles like let's make all the cars in California electric. I don't know how they're going to power them because their infrastructure is falling apart. This is part of something that's in my book because the visual thinkers that can fix that stuff are playing video games in the basement. That gets into my other talks. <laughs> they never maintained their power distribution equipment. Like, you just let it break, that's why they had the big fire. I can't believe it. 45 mile an hour wind, and you gotta turn the power off in California because the wire might fall off the great big tower. And then when it hits the tower, it makes a spark, and then you get a gigantic fire. Well, interesting. These are the kind of th interesting things. I'm seeing a picture of a bracket little round thing, it looks like a mountain climbing carabiner that holds the insulator to the cross arm. Well, they were made in 1921 and they cost 59 cents a piece. That's probably a $10 part today. It wears, you can see that wearing. And then it breaks, the whole insulator assembly falls, zap, because they failed to maintain it. Yeah, let's look at some of the things you got to do to power stuff. Well, one thing, maintain your stuff. Now let's get back to grazing. And I was reading the research of Richard Teague, and I've got a new paper I came out with that's open access. Yeah. Open access. It's completely open access. And it's titled Grazing Cattle, Sheep, and Goats, because you need, you need this title to find it. Grazing Cattle, Sheep, and Goats are important parts of a sustainable agricultural Future. Grazing cattle, sheep, and goats are an important parts of a sustainable agricultural future. Well, I dug up all the academic literature I could find, and I even put the Stockman grass farmer in there, 
But then the copy editor for the journal, since they couldn't find it online, made me write down the complete address of the Stockman grass farmer, which I did. And I think it's too bad that that stuff's not accessible. Because one of the ways to make change is just putting out how-to instructions. That's what I did with cattle handling for years. Before there was any web pages, I did that. Then I did Grandin.com in the early 90s and just started putting up how-to things. How do you actually do it? How do you handle them? How do you design the facilities? You do it. So let's look at the good things I can do with the right kind of rotational grazing, the right kind of cover crops. I can sequester carbon. I can prove biodiversity of the plants. Soil health can be improved. And I can increase pollinators. And we can do this with extensive grazing. We can also do it with cover crops. Now, one of the things is, is that these things are very location specific. Something that works in one part of the company do not work somewhere else. I cannot emphasize that enough. I'm old enough to remember when Alan Savory first came into the US. The mistake that was made is he oversold the job. And they overgrazed some ranches. It was a big mess. I was in Arizona when they did that. Never oversell a job. That's another thing you don't do. Location specific. And um, the other thing you want to do if you're doing extensive grazing is mimic how the wild bison and the other herbivores do it. They come in, mow the lawn to about half the height, then they move on. And you have plenty of time for the roots to regenerate. Here's another basic principle. I like basic principles. Nice and simple, otherwise I don't understand it. The plant's solar panels, the green stuff, that grows back before the roots do. And you have to give enough rest time for the roots to fully recover. And you're going to need to work with the local you know, agronomy people and extension people, you know, to dig up stuff and make sure the roots are fully recovering. Because you can get away with kind of chewing off the top too quickly, but that wrecks you in about three or four years. It also is going to take you three or four years to start to see the soil health benefits. This doesn't happen overnight. And also, you need the right type of cattle. What's happening right now in eastern Colorado is they're getting a lot of red Angus cattle because they've got to have a smaller animal that they can feed in the wintertime. Because what they're trying to get away from is having to feed hay all winter. That just gets too expensive, especially in eastern Colorado. Now, just last week, I drove to Nebraska, went out to Broken Bow, Nebraska, and uh, Grand Island, Nebraska, and they have bigger cows there, but they also have more hay because that area has slightly more rain. So I always like to look at innovative things. I see great fields of solar panels. They need to have sheep under them, and they need to be spaced further apart so that you can grow something else under them, maybe chickens. Yeah, the solar panels, I think the roofs are some of the best places for them. Maybe that's something they need to be doing in California. Let's get solar panels and batteries on the, in, in the houses. Cut the workload down for the power plant. You see, I'm thinking of practical stuff we can do. Nothing's abstract for me. I have to say, when I flew into um, uh, Burlington, Vermont, there was, um, I always look out the window of planes on final approach. It's amazing what you can learn. There was a ton of solar panels on the roofs of the warehouses. But again, this hybrid approach where mostly organic, but not too pure. Too pure is going to get you in trouble. You use a little bit of regular. It's probably going to be the best thing to do. And the other thing is we got to have use the right animal. If we were to go totally back to old-fashioned chickens, we take 20% more feed. And I don't like this picture. I got four semi-truck loads of grain sitting in a truck stop, and a fifth semi rolls up. That's not very sustainable. But let's say I just back off a little bit on the growth, and maybe a half a pickup load of grain rolls in. Sorry. That doesn't look so bad. What we have to do is get a much more balanced approach to um, breeding animals. Because if you just breed for grow, 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 you're going to have other problems. I like to look at breeding and how you select traits in animals, like a national budget. And if you put everything into the economy, meat, milk, or eggs. I'm going to shortchange two other important things. My infrastructure, which is going to be the bone, the heart, the lungs, also reproduction. Dairy cows now are really hard to breed, real high-producing ones. 
There's a lot of leg conformation issues in pigs and cattle that correlated with just selecting for meat. But the other thing I'm going to shortchange is the immune function. I just read some really creepy papers this morning I've been carrying around for a while about sores developing on pigs that are some weird autoimmunity problem. You know, my military's going wacko. You know, so you've got the economy, the infrastructure, and then the military. Or maybe I just breed the immune function out of them. And you see, I'm going to have to breed some of that back in so I don't have to use so many antibiotics. That's something I'm going to need to do, a more balanced approach to breeding. Um, so I'm going to tend to take the more, I take more of the bottom-up approach um, where take a specific problem, okay, like you were talking about berry boxes. Okay, that's more my approach is, okay, how do we solve the problem of berry boxes? That's something specific because the problem with some of these big general policy stuff, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. You see, there's a place for big general principles. That's the verbal thinking. But there's also where I'm seeing a lot of change is the more bottom-up approach. The other thing that I did, I designed a lot of equipment, and I got a lot of my equipment out into big packing plants. I got a piece of equipment called the center track restrainer system. Yep, Big Ag has them in all their plants. But then the issue was managing that equipment, operating that equipment correctly. Half my clients tore it up and wrecked it. Now, one of the things you can do with big corporations is you have to get vice president level executives to get out in the field. And you've got to make plastic pollution or animal welfare not abstract, where they see it. You see, in the past, animal welfare for McDonald's, let's say, for example, was an abstraction. Give it to the lawyers. Give it to PR. And make it go away. Well, back in 1997, I was hired by McDonald's to take them on their first trips to farms and slaughter plants. And I saw reactions of vice president level executives like that undercover boss show. I'll never forget the day when the McDonald's executive saw a half dead dairy cow go into their product. And they're going, mm, wow, we gotta do something about this. And that got them going. And the other thing is, there's things to learn from Big Egg. McDonald's runs a very good supply chain and they measure everything. Every single forklift pallet of beef trimmings they measure for micro count. It's not abstract. And now I've got another association I saw this spring that I didn't like. Some really nasty, skinny, organic dairy cows went into one of my clients' plants. I can't say where it was, except it was in the U.S. And I actually was with a, one of my big clients. I do have to give you a disclaimer. Costco and McDonald's pay well. I'll tell you that. But that doesn't mean that, you know, I'm going to bow down and say everything they do is wonderful. But I am giving you that, I'm declaring my conflict of interest. But I was with a very big client when he saw skinny, awful, organic dairy cows. That's not okay. Now, there's other people raising organic dairy cows that are fine. The other thing that made my thing work is that in most cases, the existing equipment that the big plants had, we were able to make it work. It is amazing how much we improve with maintenance. Stunning equipment, man, it's all about maintenance. And the other big thing was non-slip flooring. Little non-slip flooring in the right place and maintenance. And then you do some things with lighting. The other thing is training employees. And out of the 75 plants, these are all the big boys, only three had to buy capital improvement expensive equipment. And we also had to do three managerectomies which is much easier to do in a corporate thing. And after three managerectomies in these corporate plants, they improved. Well, I think, you know, there's a tendency just to bash big is bad. You know what I've learned about big? Big is fragile. It's fragile. Big is fragile rather than bad. Look what happened when the gas got turned off in Europe. That's an example of big is fragile. When big works, it's very, very efficient. But when it breaks, you're in trouble. During COVID, 300,000 head of pigs had to be killed on the farm because two big plants got, went down due to COVID. That's an example of big as fragile. The other thing is, I think you're going to be more effective is instead of attacking big, sell your own product. That's something I learned a long time ago. And then talk about how to do it. 
I didn't realize until about five years ago how important writing was in my work. All the, you know, the, all, the first, all the articles I wrote for Cattle Magazine's first 20 years, they're not even available because they never made it to online. But they were really important in making change. I must have written very similar articles about cattle handling probably several hundred times in different places, just telling them how to do it. And so there's the top-down approach, and then there's the bottom-up approach, picking out something targeted like the berry boxes. I can really relate to that. You don't want to do what California is doing, so they get all the electric cars. I don't know what they're going to power them with. Well, and then, of course, there's the nuclear option, which I know is a dirty word for a lot of people, but when they work, they sit there. And I've actually looked into, into that. There's second-generation plants that don't have the danger. They don't have that emergency cooling pump that can break. They don't have that. And uh, when they sit there, they're carbon neutral. They work. You know, I'm, it, I'm, looking at, I take, I'm looking at what would actually work. Or I've got to get solar panels on every roof. I've got to either do that, or I've got to um, put in second-generation nukes. Otherwise, I won't have enough power that's clean power. It's that simple. It's absolutely that simple. I have those two options. But then I got another little wrinkle. How many people here know that solar panels don't last forever? They degrade. Solar panels degrade. Cheap ones degrade faster than expensive ones. And they have a recycling issue, too. There is two wedding rings worth of sterling silver in every large solar panel. How do we get that back out? You know, but again, it's not abstract. I'm trying to, like, just give you a different way of looking at things. I want to solve problems. Plastics issue in the ocean. Latest thing I just read in Science and Nature that something like 60% of that's fishing gear. Loose fishing gear. Okay, now that's something you can target. Because you can track down where it's coming from with lab tests and other things. Which country is the fishing gear coming from? And that's a, that's a big source of it. You see, nothing's abstract. There's some advantages here to visual thinking. Okay, what I want to do now, and we got plenty of time, is I want to just get into some really, really good discussion. And if you don't have any questions, I'm going to just um, ask, you know, I'm going to walk around and start asking people to do questions. <laughs> and we've got a mic here that's walking around. And I'm sorry, maybe I seem a little disjointed, but that's how I think. That is how I think. It's associational rather than top-down, linear, verbal thinkers overgeneralized. Now I'm thinking of a policy they want to do in Ireland that I think is really crazy. Well, you know what they want to do in Ireland? Get rid of half their livestock. They've got year-round grazing. And mow the grass and feed it to a methane plant digester to feed to power plants. I think that's going to work real well. There's a question. No, you graze it right, and you've got to graze it right. I was just in Ireland, and I saw some overgrazed land. That's not okay. It's absolutely not okay. Do you want to go We're first? We're going to go first over here. Real quick, is anybody in the uh, government asking you to uh, use your incredible brain no. to solve for rural broadband? No, governments don't come to me. I actually have found I've made the most progress by working with private industry. It's amazing how, I, I, I used to go to the government route. In the 80s I did that, early 90s I did that, and I gave it up, because it didn't work. But things like getting those McDonald's executives out on farms for true undercover boss mode, boy, did that change things. Because they were horrified. I, um, Bob Langer, the, um, who, who I worked for at McDonald's, has a book called The Battle to Do Good. And he describes things like getting rid of the styrofoam clamshells. Big court, little guys innovate, big guys copy. And uh, that's a basic principle I've seen over and over and over and over again. And I just saw it at the dairies up in Quebec. Uh, one of the guys uh, cut the back off of a robot milking uh, thing and, and changed the doors on it. And Lily's, that's the name of the company, was throwing a big fit that they voided the warranty. And then they went out and copied his modification. You know, that was two days ago I found out about that. Um, but it's um, the other thing that, that you don't do to big corporations is when a big corporation actually does something, 
activists keep bashing them. It's very, very discouraging to a meat plant that's made a lot of changes to get picketed and bashed. Because then their attitude is, well, no matter what we do, we're going to get bashed, so we're going to just go to the lawyers. That's what ends up happening. I mean, I, I work with big corporations. And there are some people, I, I have run into a few CO2 C CEOs that had absolutely no ethics. But it, the problem is, it all becomes an abstraction. You've got to drag those suits out of the office so they find out what's going on. But I found this worked better than the government approach. We, with McDonald's, I went into developing countries like in Central America and, and worked on, and my, my, my colleague, Erica Vogue, who does consulting, is going into you know, places in Central America and helping a chicken plant that's dreadful uh, to improve. Well, you see, let's talk about the different ways of thinking. Okay, in my new book, Visual Thinking, I'm going to provide scientific research about different types of thinking. And there's a lot of kids getting labeled now, going nowhere, playing video games. And we need them to solve problems. We're paying a huge price for taking out shop classes. Also, a very short-sighted thing that big corporations did is shutting down their in-house engineering departments. While you take these big plants, like back when it used to be Montfort's, the one here, they had a huge corporate engineering department. That's all gone now. Right now, if you want to build a state-of-the-art poultry or, or um, or a pork uh, processing plant, you're getting equipment from Holland or Italy. Because we're not making it anymore. That is an issue. So a lot of people are mixtures of the different kinds of thinking. There's three basic kinds of specialized thinking. And kids that get a label are, um, tend to be extreme versions, less likely to be mixtures. I'm what's called an object visualizer. And people like me are good at art, animals, because animals live in a sensory-based world, mechanical devices, and inventing them and fixing them, and photography. So art, animals, photography, and mechanical devices, anything mechanical, that goes together. Now your second type is the visual spatial. These people think in patterns. They're your computer programmers, chemists. Oh, I, I get this magazine, Chemical and Engineering News. Man, some of the stuff they're doing now in chemistry is just magical. You know, ways that we can solve energy problems. Chemistry, physics, computer programming, um, things in patterns that require lots of mathematics. Okay, going back to the robot up in Canada, um, that dairyman who thinks visually doesn't mess with the software. You see, this, that, that requires the other type of mind. Also, the problem we've got today in our educational system with my kind of mind, we cannot do higher math. Abstract higher math we don't do. But going back to that Leli robot is my kind of mind designs the mechanical parts and then we need the mathematical mind to do the software. You see, that would be an example of two different minds working together to make something work. And then, of course, the third type is verbal. And, and verbal thinkers, uh, one of the big things I find is overgeneralization. And I find a big problem with that in the autism field. Because the problem you got with autism is you got Elon Musk at one end of the spectrum and you got uh, someone who can't dress themselves at the other end and you call it the same thing. But I'm seeing too many kids going nowhere. People that built equipment for me, that own big shops, were autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. I am serious. And those people are retiring and they are not getting replaced. Who's going to make the elevator work in this hotel? I noticed there was an ancient old Westinghouse. I didn't know Westinghouse made elevators. And we don't make elevators anymore. They're coming from Europe now. I'm also noticing that the people who fix elevators, there's a lot of gray hair. Every time they are fixing that stuff at the Denver airport, I, I take a gray hair check. <laughs> I, and they're not, the young ones aren't coming in. They're playing video games in the basement. And they're not getting wonderful jobs in the video game industry. And some of these visual thinkers that are terrible at algebra would be great at all kinds of regenerative farming. Absolutely great. And then we've got to write about what they do. And we need, we need to get the Stockman grass farmer to get their stuff up online. Um, because I can't even search their stuff. I only know about it because I subscribe to the paper copy of it. More of a bottom-up approach. Let's remember, little guys innovate.
big guys copy. And that is true for every single industry because I read tons of business magazines. Science and nature is my breakfast pleasure reading now. <laughs> because I want to see the kids that are different get up and make changes. We've got to solve some of these problems. Like berry boxes, they are disgusting. But the problem is you can't see the berries. And I hate to say that I am one of the, I eat a lot of berries and I do want to see them. <laughs> because I'm now remembering a couple of boxes of rotten berries I got. And they were rotten on the bottom. And I had to throw them out. I, I do not do politics. I have to talk to everybody. As an athletic sports person said, I want everybody to buy my shoes. And you don't want to lose half your audience. Can so I don't, I, I, I don't, see, I'm a total bottom-up approach. Okay. Now, there's a place for top-down. I will say that. But there's a place for top-down. But the problem is, you cannot do both. You almost have to choose, am I going to do the top-down approach, uh -huh. or are you going to be the person that actually fixes stuff? I have a saying, heat softens steel. I can remember, and when heat softens steel, then I can bend it into pretty grill work. So back in the 80s, when some of the activist videos started showing up, and activists are what made the McDonald's audits possible, because McDonald's sued an environmental firm for slandering them about wrecking the rainforest. And McDonald's lost half the lawsuit when it came to welfare of pigs and chickens. They were forced to look at it. That's heat softening steel. I come up and make the auditing system. But you can't do both. You almost have to pick. Am I going to be a top-down person? Or am I going to be a bottom-up person? And as a visual thinker, I'm going to be a bottom-up person. But make sure when you do top-down, you don't do something that's not going to work. You better consult some bottom-up people. Because if California doesn't do something about repairing power lines, solar panels on buildings, or maybe even the next-gen liquid nuclear, they're not going to have enough power for those cars. Yeah, that's uh, so you might get what you wish for and have a mess. But one person heats the steel, and the other person shapes the steel. You cannot do both. Kind of pick, but realize there are two sides to this. And I'd recommend the people that do top down do some consulting with people in the field so you don't ask for something that's not going to work. I can tell you one thing, so I tell you what, I've eliminated from my diet and 30 big ones came off of here. <laughs> no soda of any kind except maybe just sparkling water. Totally have eliminated it. All the sweet tea, all that stuff, get a tons of sugar out of the diet and try to do no calories from drinks except maybe very few beers or wine. And that's one of the number one things I would do, get the sugar out of so many things. That's one of the things I would do, and I know that will work because when you go, uh, I watch the amount of sweet tea pe these people drink and then I look at their waistline so now I'm thinking something politically incorrect to do. Let's get some old airline seats from an from a, uh, airline, the airline's junk warehouse, bolt the armrests down and put them around in different places. And if you can't fit in that chair, I saw a guy yesterday on the plane, he was this far into the aisle of the plane and they had to like push the cart like this. They mushed the cart up against him to get it down the aisle because he had the aisle armrest up. That was yesterday's flight. No, obesity, big number one. And then making sure that they, you know, kids get nutrients, which in the developing world is going to include a few eggs a week, is going to include some animal protein, but not eating a pound of steak a day. Uh, no obesity. And then kids getting enough nutrition. But that question yeah. was sustainability versus welfare. All right, let's go back to the fast-growing chicken issue. See, here we've got a clash between what's sustainable, the amount of grain I feed that chicken, versus welfare. Now, it's possible to have a heavy chicken that can walk. Costco's got them. Okay, I'll even show you pictures of them. And one of the things that was done was to breed some leg on them. Breed some leg. Breed a heavier leg. And there's chicken at Brand X. I have a student now who's an animal welfare auditor. He went to Brand X. I cannot give out the name. Major company. And the chickens were splay-legged. 
uh, that's absolutely not okay. What we have to do is find some balance because something as simple as reducing the feeding time by two days can be the difference between almost no deads and a whole ton of deads. See, when you push that biology, you have a system working on the edge. And if you do everything right, it's fine. One little thing wrong, things go nasty really quickly. So I think we have to start optimizing things. Let's go back to our, our economy, breeding for production, infrastructure, because the first thing that goes on pigs and cows, feet and legs, and the military, immune function. Now pigs have got some really, I couldn't believe these papers I read this morning. I've been carrying them around in my bag for two weeks and I read them this morning and I'm going, ah! This is something really messed up with pigs, getting weird inflammatory stuff. It's looking at sort of more balanced approach where we can't go back to the old fashioned chickens, but you back off a little bit on the production and you gotta breed some of these other things back in. You can't just over, over select for feed conversion because that's gonna get you in trouble real fast. It's sort of, but you don't just throw away everything that you might call big egg. Now on the other hand, let's say in a developing country, these real fancy chickens that Costco has, I don't think they should be raising those in Central America. They just don't have the management expertise. You see, because a high performance bird requires high performance feed. You will have to put methionine in the feed. You've got to feed them high performance. And you've got to be a good manager. Because I saw a situation where in a brand new chicken farm, you had two sheds full of great big birds. One was perfect and the birds were a mess in the other barn. So I started asking what was different? And what was different was where they got the breeder eggs from. And I heard this word spot market. I hope you know what spot markets are. That's how they sell um, uh, Russian oil right now. Every industry has them. And um, you buy uh, breeder eggs to hatch from a crappy place. You're gonna end up with crappy chickens. And that's what happened. You see, you've got to, to, to make a high performance bird work. You've got to do everything. You, there's no, almost no margin for error. See, that's the thing. But to just say all high performance birds are terrible, um, you know, and you also have to make sure we watch for the immune function because I'm getting worried about some systemic infections they've been getting. Remember, economy, infrastructure, and military. And um, everything takes energy. Everything takes energy. And let's say I genetically engineer a bird to do all three of those, I won't have enough feed to feed it. Unless you fed it all kinds of weird supplements. It's just that simple. Okay. Okay, my question is going to end with the price of ground bison versus the price of ground beef. But just give me a second, because you mentioned Alan Savory. So I went out to the West Bijou, that land of West Bijou Ranch, 8,000 acres. Just well, you see now, come. Alan, but you see the stuff where Alan Savory had a problem, that was 70s when yeah. he first came into the U.S. I'm sure things have totally changed now. Yeah, so it's 8,000 acres just south of Byers, Colorado, 8,000 natural grazed okay. acres of bison. And I went out there to meet the rancher, Cannon. It was the grandson of the big bison guy. And we were pulling hay off of the thing because they've been feeding them hay all summer because they haven't had rain since August 1st. Yeah, the whole thing since August 1st, terrible. they haven't had rain. So we're feeding the bison hay. They shouldn't even be getting hay. But anyway, price of bison. We just bought 10,000 bison burgers last week for my school district. Okay, um, well, the good. Director. Okay, now that's doing something local. Yep. That um, I'm all for that sort of thing. I'm totally into real things that real things that work. Yeah. And bison have a slightly different. You see, now you get into which animal is the best. Bison have a. Uh, they're a little different grazing pattern than cattle do. Goats will eat all the rough stuff. Yeah, but so it comes down to the price of bison versus the price of beef. We work for, I work for a school district. We're supposed to watch the bottom line. It's taxpayer money, right? We've got to be careful. But we paid $8 a pound for the best premium ground bison patties last Wednesday yep. for Colorado Proud Day. Beef, we were paying $4 a pound out of legacy ground meats out of Greeley. So we paid twice as much. We lost our ass that day. We lost all a bunch of money. But hey, it's great for marketing. But the, the bison ranchers keep telling me that if the true price of beef can, comes up, that it's going to inch up and well, the other thing, we'll be paying eight for each. That, there's some really good points here. Let's go back to supply chains. Okay. If I, I don't care what it is for, and then I'm going to tell you about how leaves figured out their supply chain biologically. Okay. Greeley's very efficient, but if you break it, you're in trouble. If you have a more distributed supply chain, it's going to be more expensive, but it doesn't break as easily. 
That's a basic principle. Let me tell you what Leaves decided to do. Um, the ginkgo plant has straight veins like this. So if you rip the, um, the leaf, there's no alternative supply. That part of the leaf will die. So Leaves, you know, just from evolution, decided to make a more just convoluted distributed supply chain where you've got to grow more convoluted veins. That takes energy. But you can tear part of that leaf, or the caterpillars can eat part of that leaf, and it still lives. So the trees decided to have more distributed supply chain. See, this is a problem. Big is fragile. And when I first started realizing that, we had a flood here. I'm never going to forget this drive home from the airport. I had to go to, to get home from the airport uh, you know, on the toll road. I went out the toll road, and then uh, I-25 was closed. So I went all the way around by Greeley. The water was lapping at the edge of the Cooner, yard, Cooner feed yard. There was a bridge sticking out of the water this much. I went over it. It was not submerged. It was closed an hour later. And it really made me think, big is fragile. You know, that that water had come up another two feet, it would have flooded the feed guard. You see, and just looking at that made me think. And then COVID came along, and now everybody's got to shove the biggest fragile. So the thing, the reason for maybe paying a little bit more is supporting a distributed supply chain. Because when things break, that's when you need the distributed supply chain. And I don't care what the product is. Okay, I had to buy a new car. I wanted an SUV. I couldn't believe it. This was about three months ago. I went to our biggest dealer in town. You know how many new vehicles they had on the lot at this dealer? They had two. And I bought a white SUV that was sitting out by their shop. And the trucks that were in the window were tricked up on uh, used trucks that had been detailed. Yeah, chip shortage. Yeah. There's one big factory in the world for chips, and if that one breaks, we'll be in a pile of trouble for anywhere from two to five years. Because I've been following that supply chain, too. We're trying to build chip factories right now. Do we have the chips to put in the machines that make the chips? You've got to really, really think about your supply chain. And so the advantage of those bison burgers, even though they're more expensive, that supply chain's less likely to break. That's the thing. This is kind of the paradox of supply chain management, no matter whether it's electronic chips or meat. You know, the other thing, you know, it's also very wasteful, lawns. Man, you go into suburban areas, it's something horrible, like half the water being used in suburban areas. Lawns. What if we planted vegetables on all those lawns? No, I mean, really, really, really. Solar panels on the house? Battery. Okay, let's look at battery supply chain. Periodic table of the elements, nickel, cobalt, lithium. Uh, mined in not very nice places. We've got to really get serious about battery recycling. So we can get those, those things, are periodic uh, uh, elements are on the periodic chart. We can't make that stuff. You know, battery recycling. This is something we and then really figure out how to do it. And that's going to take the chemists that I read about in chemistry and engineering news. Not my, my kind of mind. My kind of mind thinks up that here's your project uh, chemists you need to do. Because we've got to recycle all that battery stuff. Solar panel stuff too. What I hope I've done is to really make you think about things in a different way. And how different kinds of minds can work together. And I tend to go a more targeted approach, like the berry, the berry containers, or maybe plastic out in the sea. Now, this changing the language, I totally agree with that. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of corporate speak. Yeah, let's say the word plastic, because that's what needs to get cleaned up. Yeah, that's, uh, no, it's disgusting. I believe you may have been to the developing world, and I've seen that plastics waste. Okay, right there. Five minutes, okay. Well, we've got time for a couple of more questions in five minutes. And when it's time for lunch, look good. I already got, got a preview of it. And it looks absolutely wonderful. Okay. I'm old enough to remember collecting Coke bottles, the little six ounce Cokes. 
There were six ounces. We, uh, we had an ice grinding machine in our house, and I put a six ounce Coke on it, not a 20 ounce Coke over it, and the glass milk bottles. I remember that. But that's, and I agree with that, but that's something much more targeted. You're likely to be more effective if you work more at a local level. Let's try to do glass milk bottles and glass uh, juice, uh, orange juice bottles. And that's happening. And that kind of stuff, sometimes that's more effective. The berry boxes, the glass bottles. And we recycle that stuff. Yeah, that's right. And that's something that we ought to be doing. Okay, let's talk about the labels. I'm going to guess that, and this is in the new book visual thing, that 20% of the people that built my equipment or laid out entire big factories were either autistic, dyslexic, or ADHD. And how did they get into the field? They, well, the mechanics either grew up working on cars or they took a single welding class. See, there's a relationship here with what's going on in the schools. And I've seen parents get so locked into the label that maybe their kid's a math genius and they both were programmers and they didn't think teach their kid computer programming. Um, one of the biggest problems is autism carries is such a big wide um, field variation now that parents get locked into the labels. They overprotect the kids. Kids are not learning shopping. See, now I'm thinking of a specific example at one of the airports. I was sitting in the gate waiting for a flight. Well, it was, wasn't Denver. It was one of the medium-sized airports somewhere. And, and a mom and her 12-year-old come up to me, and they wanted to get a picture. And then I, the girl was fully verbal, and I asked her if she'd ever shopped. So I gave her a $5 bill, and I said, go across to that store across the hall and buy something. And she bought a drink, brought me back the change. It was the first time she had shopped by herself. Kids are not learning basic skills. I just read an email this morning that came in from a girl who is now a successful adult autistic, and she said one of the most important things that she was taught was life skills. We're oftentimes getting too much emphasis on the academics, not enough emphasis on life skills. So I was a horrible, horrible high school student who got kicked out of a school for throwing a book at a girl. I went to special school for kids with problems. You know what they did with me? They put me to work running the horse barn. For three years, I cleaned nine stalls every day, fed them, put them in and out, learned responsibility, never leave the feed box open. And I see that right now, I see this big wooden feed box and it had a lid that came down like this, put the hasp down, turn the knob on it. That was responsibility. Make sure the feed box was, was closed. And my mother was a bit concerned that I wasn't learning academics. And Mr. Patey, the headmaster, goes, let her work through her adolescence. The academics can be made up. He was right. I learned how to work. And, and th these kids are not learning that. And I would, um, I'm, you know, I'm not saying everybody on the spectrum should go into a skilled trade. The skilled trade route is one thing where you can do high-end skilled trades. That's for my kind of mind. Animals, mechanics, metalworking. And one of the advantages of metalworking is when you're 60 and 70, you got nice hoists in the shop. So it's a lot easier for older people can still do it. The mathematicians, chemistry, computer programming. Um, We've got to start looking at what they can do. Stephen Hawking said, concentrate on the things your disability doesn't prevent you from doing well. And he could do math in his head really well. I read an article on the plane yesterday about a violinist who got polio when he was a kid that couldn't walk. He says, I'm a musician first, a polio person second. I'm, I'm really into the careers. OK, we're going to have to wrap it up. And thank you all for coming. Thank you, Tim.